the Psychedelic Integration Coach and Psychedelia Psychedelic Experience Integration are a collective of professionals and peers interested in the potential psychological and spiritual healing properties of psychedelics. Our events are intended for the purpose of educating about mindful and safe integration of entheogenic experiences, offering emotional support, and creating meaningful connections between community members. Find more information at www.psychedelicintegrationcoach.com slash events, and may you live that psychedelic feeling. Well, the services I offer to clients are psychedelic preparation and integration, Transformational coaching, I do a lot of men's coaching around love, sex, and intimacy, partly for, informed by my five-year study and practice with Tantra. Um, you know, in doing preparation work with clients, they'll ask me a lot of questions, like they'll say, should I do DMT first? And I'll say, no, you shouldn't do DMT first. Okay. And you should lay out the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> but they'll also ask questions about, uh, you know, underground ceremonies and although you see a lot of pictures and a lot of talk about guides when it comes to things like MD, uh, MDMA studies with uh, maps and some of the studies at NYU, UCLA, we're going to be talking about for the most part underground guides tonight. So first, this talk is being given for the purposes of harm reduction and education. I'm not encouraging anyone to use illegal substances or encourage or uh, engage in illegal behavior of any kind and if I say anything that sounds like advice about using psychedelics I am assuming that you are going to make sure that's legal in the area that you're in when that happens. So this is what we're talking about. We've all seen these pictures. Someone with eye shades and headphones, someone sitting next to them, that's a guide. This is done with a lot of different substances. For the most part tonight, we're going to be talking about probably psilocybin and MDMA. People do this with LSD, people do it with iboga or ibogaine. We're going to be talking mostly about MDMA and psilocybin. So do I think this is the right way or best way to do the psychedelics? No. I always say that you can't do psychedelics wrong. There's no right way to do it. Once you are safe and responsible, meaning you're not hurting yourself or someone else, then I think it's up to you. Do I think that you should be cooking ayahuasca in your kitchen, doing it alone in your bedroom? No, I don't. That's probably not a good idea for 99.5% of the population. But it's not up to me to put human context and opinions around how you use psychedelics. Is it better than recreational use? No. I think that recreational is used as a pejorative in the psychedelic community far too much. My friend Ashley Booths once said, I prefer the, the word celebratory, and I adopted that. I don't think there's anything wrong with you enjoying nature, a movie, another person's body, food, whatever you want, through the lens of a psychedelic substance. It's not up to me to tell you that it's sacred, that it has to be respected, that it has to be used intentionally or in a ceremonial setting. Do I have my opinions about that? Yeah. But it's up to you how you do this. Why would someone have this experience? Well, a lot of times it's people who have things like depression, OCD, anxiety, PTSD. It might be people who just feel stuck in their lives. They might have some issue they're trying to deal with, like childhood trauma. They might just want some kind of mystical or religious experience. Will it cure depression? That's a loaded question. A lot of people see pictures like this and read about the studies maps and other places are conducting and think, I'm going to do MDMA. I'm going to put on some eye shades and headphones. I'm going to do MDMA for a couple, couple of hours. I'm going to cure my PTSD. Well, the majority of the studies that are done, the clinical studies, have a therapeutic component included in this. So you have this experience, but on each side of the experience, you have trained licensed therapists who are preparing people and helping them with integration afterwards. It's not just putting on eye shades and headphones. Are psychedelics incredibly healing? Yes, they are. Will some people have depression, OCD, anxiety, PTSD cured with one session with psychedelics? That's possible. But it's kind of a crapshoot when you're doing it one time or a couple of times without therapeutic support. Just want to make that clear. Should you do this? I don't know. That's up to you. <laughs> Hopefully, if it's something that you want to do, you'll have some questions answered tonight. If you do, you should think long and hard about it because psychedelics are not for everyone. This is not a path for everyone. There are many things to be taken into consideration when you do psychedelics including your state of mind at the time, psychological and physical health, where you are in your life, what you expect from this. A lot of things to be considered. Please think long and hard before you engage with entheogenic substances. So, in order to talk about why this experience is different from, say, doing psychedelics with your friends or at a festival, we need to talk about the influence of setting on the effects of psychedelics. So in working with clients, and especially in psychedelic integration circles, we get a lot of new people. 
lot of people have not worked with psychedelics for many years and they're coming back to them. So they'll go over their psychedelic history. And there's one line that I've heard many, many times when people tell this history. <laughs> Seriously, I've heard this so much that when I drive by a college campus, I think everybody in there is on mushrooms. <laughs> and if they're not, they're going to be soon. But usually this is followed with something like it was a very powerful experience. More often than not, it's like, well, it was okay. It wasn't like I hear about people having ego death or you know, really powerful religious experience. Uh, it was okay. Well, a lot of that has to do with setting. So let me ask first, how many people have the experience of being severely altered? Psychedelics, cannabis, alcohol, what have you. And then unexpectedly encountering an authority figure law enforcement officer, parent, teacher, someone like that, and suddenly not being nearly as altered as you were when that person shows up. <laughs> that has a lot to do with setting. We're going to talk about that. So what are the kind of settings where you might do psychedelics? Well, there's ceremony. And the psychedelic community, when we say we're in ceremony, we'll be in ceremony, we're generally talking about an ayahuasca ceremony. There's this weird thing. You know how you meet people and you're both saying, I know we've met each other. Where do we know? Do you know Jim? Do you know Bob? In the psychedelic community, we do that. And the way we get out of it, we say, oh, it's, it's probably ceremony. Yeah. And everybody says, oh, yeah, it's ceremony. Then you're done. There are ceremonies for mushrooms, NN and 5-MeO-DMT, San Pedro, salvia, cannabis ceremonies. But generally, when we say ceremony in the psychedelic community, we're talking about an ayahuasca ceremony. That can be led by a shaman or facilitator. We'll talk about the difference in those. You can do those in public with other people. I don't know this for a fact, but I've heard rumors that places like Lightning in a Bottle and Burning Man are places where people do psychedelics. <laughs> I can't prove that. You can do them alone. And yes, if you Google images of people doing psychedelics, they are all in lotus position, usually in this kind of mudra. And that happens to me when I do psychedelics, so I understand it. And my chakras light up too, so I know why that picture's like that. Or you could do this eye shades and headphones. To me, when this is done alone, I tend to, to refer to it as a therapeutic experience. When there's another person with you, I call it a guided experience. But what's the difference between being shut off from the outside world with eye shades and headphones and interacting with the world? Well, when you are uh, you know, interacting with the world with other people, you're in a subject-object mode. So right now, I am the subject, you are the object. So I'm aware that I'm in a room full of people. I have to stand a certain way. I need to have this microphone here. Someone might come in the door. I know some people. I have to acknowledge them. You're sitting in a chair. You might be next to someone you know. You might be next to someone you don't know. You're cognizant of your own personal space and their space. You know, you shouldn't touch certain parts of your body. You're thinking, you know, it's probably okay to do this, but if I'm turning this way, I probably don't want to do that. Um, you know, you're aware of things that are going on. And beneath that awareness, there are a lot of subconscious processes going on. There are five different subconscious processes involved in you hearing, understanding, contextualizing, and storing the words that I'm saying right now. Louder? Is that what you're saying? Oh, okay. Can everybody hear me okay before that? Should I start over? Okay, just checking. So there are conscious and subconscious processes that are in operation when you are dealing with the outside world. A lot of distractions. Suddenly, when you're on psychedelics, those conscious processes go out the window. So if you're like this woman, and you took mushrooms and then got called into work and you're in a meeting with your boss, <laughs> you're trying to remember what you're supposed to do in social settings. Like she's thinking, he's holding his hand on, am I supposed to grab it and do this? Do I look him in the eyes? Is it getting creepy now? Am I staring? Am I supposed to nod? Am I nodding too much? All that goes out the window. So when you do psychedelics with other people, you have a lot of things you have to pay attention to, and now you have to remember the things that you used to know automatically. The effectiveness of psychedelics is reduced every time your consciousness increases this kind of activity. Even when you're alone, you're still aware that I'm a person, I'm in a room, I'm outside, I'm looking at this tree, which is apparently very tiny. I'm on psychedelics, I'm not sure if that's because it's a bonsai or it's far away because of the perspective thing. But your mind is still working all the time when you're looking at the outside world. When you cut yourself off sensorily, when you put on eye shades and headphones, you, body, mind, and soul, become the subject and the object. Everything that's happening with you is happening in your brain. What does that look like when you add psychedelics? Well, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs, on psilocybin. Usually dormant parts of your brain light up. Parts of your brain that don't usually communicate are talking to each other, having this lively conversation. 
So long forgotten, suppressed or neglected memories come to mind. Aha moments, realizations and insights. Context is given to past events from your history. What else might happen? You might feel moments of bliss, experience oneness with the universe or everyone in it. Absence of symptoms, so people who have depression suddenly say my depression has been cured only to see it creep back two or three hours later. Reframing. So, episodes of empathy and compassion for yourself and others cause a shift in perspective in regard to, to episodes from your past, giving you the opportunity to reframe those episodes and receive psychological healing. Background healing. So when we are healed psychologically and even physically, we take in information, we might listen to people, we might talk to someone about our problems, we might evaluate the situation, eventually some neuro neural pathway is developed. Somewhere in our body cells are changed. Psychedelics have the ability to go right to that area, create a new neural pathway, or change the cells in your body without you having to do anything. Blanking out. Almost, I'm sorry, resistance. So when things start coming up for you, emotions start rushing through your body, things that you don't want to think about that you've tried not to think about for many years suddenly come into your consciousness, it can very, be very uncomfortable. So what do psychedelics do? They distract you. They make you extremely uncomfortable. They make you feel like you have to take off the eye shades and headphones, that you need to move around, that you need to go outside, that you need to talk, that you need to do anything but sit with yourself and think about the things that are coming up in your mind. There are a lot of different forms that resistance takes, and there are ways to address it, but it's extremely uncomfortable. You know, there are some overarching lessons that we get from psychedelics. One of them, when you take a little tiny bit of a substance and you just feel like nothing in the world can make anything right, is a message to tell you that you are struggling against something that's not really there, like we do every day with worry and stress. Blanking out is not uncommon. Some people say, it wasn't very visual for me, I didn't feel much, I just don't know where I was. It was kind of dark, I was in another place. There's often background healing going on when there's blanking out. Confusion. Psychedelics talk to us in very mysterious and novel ways sometimes. So, all of us have beliefs about the way that the world operates. Many of those beliefs were given to us before we were in five years old. So if you believe that you're not worthy of love, I can tell you that you are. Your friends can tell you you are. Everyone in the world can tell you that you are. But it just doesn't get through to you because that's not what you believe. So we have defenses against words. So psychedelics don't hold up a sign to say you're worthy of love. Sometimes they play games with us, simulations. They cause emotions to happen on us. They show us movies. Sometimes they scare us. Sometimes they scare the shit out of us. That brings us to the issue of whether or not there's such a thing as a bad trip. You know, in the psychedelic community, we like to say things like, there's no such thing as a bad trip, just difficult experiences. And then we follow that up with something like, difficult experiences are some of the most rewarding. Well, that might be true. But you might have gone through this. You might know someone who's gone through this. You might have heard someone talk about an experience like this. If you haven't, you're just a couple of Google clicks away from seeing terrifying experiences like this from people who weren't ready to do psychedelics. I don't think I should be telling these people that this isn't bad. It might be rewarding though I get over it, but sometimes when I hear people say we shouldn't talk about this and say bad trip because it might discourage people from doing psychedelics, frankly, if someone's not ready for this, then they shouldn't do psychedelics. And if you are in the helping profession, if you're telling people about how to prepare for this and you don't tell them, you're doing them a disservice. So yeah, I think there's such a thing as a bad trip. You know, difficult childhoods might make people even stronger. I'm living proof of that. But that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as a bad childhood. Suffering is an opportunity for transformation, but it's still suffering. There are a lot of questions when people come to circles or come to me for advice before an experience about, am I looking for a shaman? Is that a sitter? Do I need a guide, a facilitator? So what exactly are those? Facilitator is sort of a catch-all term. You also hear practitioner. Someone who facilitates an entheogenic experience. We'll talk a little bit more about exactly what that is. Shaman belongs to or studied with a particular lineage. That could be a blood lineage or a spiritual lineage. They've studied a lot about plant medicine. They've probably spent extensive time in the jungle. You know, shaman is actually a Siberian term. We've adopted that term to talk about people who are commonly in South America called ayahuasqueros or curanderos or curanderos. But for purposes of this conversation, 
Shaman is someone who serves ayahuasca in a ceremonial setting. Sitter is someone you get to stay with you who is sober, not on psychedelics, to make sure that you are safe and that you're okay, that your needs are taken care of. Guide is someone who is trained and experienced with a particular psychedelic who can prepare you, create a safe container for you, intervene with nece when necessary, not intervene <laughs> when they shouldn't, and help you with integration. Facilitator might seem to be somebody who serves ayahuasca, who may not be a shaman, call themselves a facilitator. Sometimes that's because they don't have the extensive training that some shamans do. Some people just don't call themselves shaman because they're not indigenous, out of respect. Facilitator may be somebody who oversees or conducts a ceremony with some kind of substance. Maybe someone who administers a substance, including cannabis. Could also be a term used for a guide. Shaman should have deep knowledge of plant medicine. Once again, studied in the jungle. They dieted plants, which means that mostly in relative isolation, they've had a poor, uh, mostly bland diet that consists largely of liquefied version of a particular kind of plant so they can get to know the energy and spirit of that plant and its healing properties. They can raise or lower the energy of a room using sound. If you've been in an ayahuasca ceremony, you probably experienced this. Personally, the first ceremony I was in, I was surprised when uh, one of the facilitators was playing the flute. He was playing a pretty, you know, everyone had purged and it was kind of quiet for a while. They were playing music. One of the facilitators was playing a flute. He was playing sort of an intense kind of snake charmer song. And when he started playing it, I got a little anxious and people started purging. Some people were retching as though they couldn't purge, but they couldn't stop themselves. And another facilitator leaned over and said, it's too much. He said, are you sure? She said, yeah, it's too much, take it down. So he slowed it down and people stopped purging. Shamans can direct and move unseen energies. They can heal. They take care of participants who are in difficulty. They create Icaros, songs written by and for ayahuasca on the fly. You hear some standard Icaros and medicine songs when you're in ceremony, but Icaros traditionally are made up on the spot by shamans. <coughs> They're channeled. Shamans can have hundreds or even thousands of Icaros. It's said that the more Icaros a shaman has, the more powerful he is. Sitter, someone who stays with you while they are sober and you're under the influence to make sure you're safe. They should know CPR. They should have experience with psychedelics. If they don't, they might call an ambulance very soon after you start having your experience. So you want someone who has some kind of experience with psychedelics and understands what it is that you're going <coughs> through at the time. They need to be willing to call for help. I call for an ambulance if you need it and stay there and tell, and tell the people what you took and when. And it needs to be somebody that you trust and you're comfortable with. This person might have to hold your hand while you go to the bathroom. A guide has experience with psychedelics, specifically the one they're talking to you about working with. They should be scared, skilled in preparation and integration. They should be able to tell you everything that's going, in, going to go into the experience and help you feel safe and prepare you for what, what's about to come. They should understand psychology, know how to screen people, know when to intervene and when not to. You don't need to be interrupted in your experience by someone who wants to ask you how you're okay or tell you that something's not so bad. Someone needs to understand what you're going and what your process is and when to leave you alone. There's a time to intervene and there's a time when that's just interrupting. Should know what to do and not to do when someone's having a difficult experience or a bad trip. They should be willing to be arrested to keep you safe. They should be willing to call an ambulance and police and while the handcuffs are being put on them, tell them exactly what kind of substance they gave you at what time and what your medical history is. And again, it should be someone that you feel safe with and that you trust completely. So, why listen to music? We know we're going to cut ourselves off sensorily. But what happened to Terrence McKenna saying that she should take five grams in silent darkness? Why am I going to listen to music? Well, music has a long history with psychedelics. We'll talk about that in a minute. But some of the recent research is pretty fascinating. Mendel Kalin is a researcher at the Beckley Foundation, specifically researches the effects of music on psychedelics. He says, we found that the interaction between music and LSD specifically increases the information going from a region of the brain specializing in personal memory to the visual cortex, which is involved in the construction of mental images. 
And the greater the magnitude to which this happens, the more vivid and autobiographical the images became. So let's back this up. So images help move your personal memories into the space where pictures are created. So again, this is psychedelics communicating with us in novel and unusual ways by taking your memories and making pictures and movies out of them so that you can watch them from an impassionate point of view and see what happened to you in your past. So music in connection with psychedelics around the world. The Bwiti spiritual practice of West Africa uses iboga as one of its pillars. The active ingredient of iboga is ibogaine, a very powerful psychoactive tryptamine that will immobilize people for 18 to 36 hours. It produces what's been uh, described as a waking dream state. It's one of the most powerful psychedelics. It's probably got the most heavy body load of any psychedelic. Bwiti music is a complex structure of layered, fast-changing rhythms that's said to enhance trance and visionary states. It uses mouth bow, harp, percussion, and vocals. It's usually polyrhythmic. Sometimes it has binaural beats. So not only is the music polyrhythmic, but there's usually dancing going on, going on in the iboga ceremonies that's polyrhythmic. One person dancing in this rhythm, this person dancing in another. If you've ever listened to Bwiti music while on iboga or ibogaine, you will feel that music controlling the, medic the medicine inside your body. You'll feel the music and the psychedelic cooperating with each other, just as you do with Icaros and Ayahuasca. And the Bwiti say it serves as an anchor between this dimension and others as a means of locomotion. Icaros, which are sang and played with ayahuasca. Once again, we talked about how Icaros use things like to help people purge, help them through difficult times, to dispel energies or spirits, to open or close ceremonies. They're very powerful as well. The first time I did ayahuasca, it started coming on, and I had these three-dimensional images that were coming up for me. I thought, this is kind of like strong mushrooms. And then they started playing the music, and there was a fourth dimension that was added. <laughs> there was something extra in the visuals when the music started playing. Later in that same ceremony, there was a song playing. And as it played, I saw grains of sand start to build a model of a room. And I realized it was the bathroom from a house that I used to live in years before. But I was seeing it from an angle that I'd never seen it from before. I would have had to be in the wall to see it from this angle. But I recognized it. I could see a ding in the wall where I'd hit it with a paint roller. I could see a mark on the toilet I'd forgotten about and was slowly building this room while the song played. And then the song stopped and the sand all collapsed and fell on the ground. I wasn't sure why the song stopped, but then I heard the person who'd been playing the flute saying, what do you need? Someone said, I'm trying to get to the bathroom. <laughs> And he said, would you please wait until the song's over? <laughs> but I lost my model. But that vision was being powered by the music. <coughs> so the modern concept of using music in, in, in uh, headphones during a journey pretty much got popularized during the 60s. And there are some generally agreed on principles about how that <coughs> music should be or what kind of music should be played. And that pretty much comes down to, they should follow progression of the experience, come up, peak, come down, landing. And it should be instrumental, or there shouldn't be any lyrics that you understand. Then we're all over the map. Should be classical, ambient, tribal, ethnic, no more than two instruments. Some people say one instrument, some people say just piano, some people say just guitar. No comp complex layered orchestration is better. Should be music the subject is familiar with because that's going to anchor them to something and make them feel good. It should not be music someone's familiar with because that's going to anchor them to some story and you want them to be able to free, feel free and work on whatever they need to work on. It should be used to pro provoke emotions. If someone's feeling sad, play a sad song. Should never be used to provoke emotions. That's manipulative. Well, it should be used to provoke emotions, but it just shouldn't be too pushy. There are theories that practitioners have about using certain songs at certain times to lull people into a nice, uh, easy state and then jerk them out with something that makes them sort of nervous. There are theories about using sad songs and then having ambient music in between so that people can process and not move from one emotion to the other too quickly. There are a whole lot of interesting theories about what to do with music in the psychedelic experience. But I just want to touch on this thing about music being pushy or provocative or manipulative. So 
Who's up for audience participation? No, we're not handing out mushrooms, by the way. <laughs> there we go. So now you ought to close your eyes. A song about someone who was very kind to you when you were small. People treated you like a child, but this person was always very interested in what you had to say. And when you went to see them, the light of their attention shone fully on you. You used to get excited about going to see them. It's something you still remember when you think about your childhood. Someone who's very special to you. Okay, wait a second. Does everyone remember where they parked? Okay, sorry, you can close your eyes. Except I was wrong about what this song was about, so close your eyes. The song is about someone who passed away. It's a person who was very special to you. You still remember the day that you heard that they weren't here anymore. And then there was a time when you thought about telling them something, calling them, sending an email, and suddenly remember that they weren't here anymore. There's still a hole in your heart where that person used to reside. Did anyone feel more than one emotion? Nobody? Yeah. All right. So for at least six people, <laughs> music can be evocative, music can be provocative, but sometimes music is just something that accompanies us on a journey that we were already taking regardless of what we were listening to. Or, as famous LSD researcher and psychedelic guy Bill Richard says, I do not feel that music causes particular experiences. Rather, it supports and undergirds the experiential flow as content is emerging for the particular person. So how do you find a guide? This is a question I hear often, and I have a standard answer. <laughs> Not on you. I can't tell you where to find a guide. That's illegal. Why would you ask me that? Hello. Hello. But we can help you figure out what to look for in a guide, if and when you should look for one. Luckily, our friends at the AWARE Project put, put together something called the Sitting Safe Guide. So if you can't remember this URL, you can just Google AWARE Project Sitting Safe. There's a lot of valuable information in there. Some of it has been lifted to help put together part of this presentation. I'll give everybody a minute to take a picture if you'd like to. All right, so. When you're looking for a guide, you should be very, very comfortable with this person. If you have any doubts about this person, if they seem pushy, if you don't like something about them, if they're annoying, you should probably move on and find someone else. That's not a good idea. They should be knowledgeable, grounded, present, and attentive. If someone is distracted while they're talking to you about possibly acting as a guide for you, they're probably not going to be able to hold space very well for you while you're in a very vulnerable state. You should feel as though this person's attention is fully on you, answering your questions and paying attention to you. They should be able to answer all of your questions. And one of my pet peeves is when someone answers a question when they don't, when they don't know. If they don't know, they should say, I don't know, but I'll find out. But it shouldn't be a, a simple question about psychedelics. They shouldn't be trying to close you quickly. It's not buying a pair of shoes. After you talk to a guy, they should tell you, I want you to take some time and think about this and think about how comfortable you are with me before you make this decision. They should be, once again, willing to go to jail to keep you safe. They should understand basic psychological concepts, preferably someone who has training in this area. If they're offering to do therapy with you, what are their qualifications? Are they a licensed therapist? If I'm looking for a therapist right now, I'm looking for a licensed therapist. If I'm looking for a therapist who's going to work with me under the influence of psychedelics, I'm going to be looking for a very good licensed therapist who has experience working with people who are under the influence of psychedelics. There are a lot of things that come into play when you are in, under the influence of psychedelics. Issues like transference, counter-transference projection loom very large when you are under the influence of a psychedelic substance. Your facilitator should not be your experience. There's a difference between psychedelic-assisted therapy and psycholytic therapy. 
That was done mostly in the 70s under light doses of LSD. It's not something that should be done with you when you're on a large dose of, dose of mushrooms, especially not from someone who's just been to school and has a, a degree in psychology, has no supervision, training, or licensing. They should be skilled in preparation and integration, or at least be able to refer you to someone who does integration work. But frankly, one of the things that bothered me when I read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, is what they called integration. Talk to the person for a half an hour the day after. I've talked to people who said the person who they sat with did integration with them by coming back to them and reading down the things that they said during their journey, and that was the extent of the integration. That's not integration. And you should feel confident in their ability to hold space for you during moments of extreme vulnerability. And the term hold space is used a lot, so I'm going to give you a definition that I think is applicable in this situation. To be with someone supporting their truth or reality with unconditional empathy and compassion, but without ego or judgment and without trying to fix them. People should not be trying to tell you that things aren't as bad as you think when you're in the, when the, under the influence of psychedelic. They shouldn't be trying to help you reframe and shift things. That's your process. That's not for someone to help you help you do while you're under the influence. What kind of question should you ask a guide? How long have you been practicing with this medicine? Where do you get your medicine? How many people have you facilitated for? How did you train for this? How do you prepare people for journeys? What can you tell me about your integration process? <coughs> if you're using a medication, do you know the safety of this substance for my medical condition? And what are the risks or contraindications in working with this medicine? Spoiler alert, if they say none, you should run. There are always risks and contraindications with psychedelics. Someone should know the full weight of those. What kind of question should they ask you? What if any pharmaceuticals are you taking? How much, how often, for how long? For what underlying condition? People take medication that sometimes uses antipsychotic at certain doses to help them sleep. Are they taking this antipsychotic or is it sleep medication? Do you have personal family history of mental health issues? Do you drink alcohol how much? Do you take recreational drugs? What kind, how much, and how often? Do you have any medical conditions that you are being treated for or anything significant in your medical history? Have you experienced any physical, emotional, inter interpersonal, sexual, or other trauma in your childhood or adulthood? And if you are talking to a guide, if you have experienced sexual trauma in your past, if you are a female and that trauma is with the male, you should not be working alone with the male guide and vice versa. When was the last time you took any psychoactive substance? Are you sensitive in general to psychedelic substances and you tend to have a high or low tolerance? Those are at least some of the questions that the guide should be asking you. What happens before a guided journey when you're working with a guide? Well, all your questions should be answered to your satisfaction. Medical and psychological history should be taken. Rules and nature of possible interaction, intervention, or direction between you and your guide should be very clearly outlined. So direction, how are they going to tell you to do something? They're probably going to tell you that you can't have your phone or make phone calls, but if you pick up your phone, what are they going to say? Are they going to tell you, put your phone down right now? I've talked to more than three people who have been traumatized by God's guide saying, you need to put the eye shades on right now, <laughs> while someone's under the influence of psychedelics. They should know how to direct you. What are you going to tell me if I'm doing something that's not good for me? When are you going to intervene? What's going to happen if I'm having a hard time and I ask you for help? What if I tell you that I'm done and I want you to leave because I'm not sure if you're real and this is part of the matrix? I've had people tell me that's happened before. How are they going to handle these situations? Is there going to be touch? If I ask to have you hold my hand, you're going to hold my hand, you're going to give me a hug. If I say, hey, I'm uncomfortable with that. If I say, you're pissing me off right now, I don't want to talk to you. What does that mean to you? That's a good thing to ask a potential guy. Hey, if, I do, if you do something that pisses me off, what's going to happen? They should tell you, I'm going to take note of that because that's going to tell me something about what's going on with you. Not, I'm going to get pissed off about it or take it personally. Your dosage should be agreed upon. You should know what you are taking and exactly how much. Is there going to be a booster involved if I don't feel like that's enough? And when am I going to take that? Are you going to ask me about it? What questions are you going to take to make sure that I need that booster and I'm not just taking too much? We're probably all familiar with the oh shit cup and concept in ayahuasca. 
you drink a cup of ayahuasca, you're not sure it's working. They say, anybody want a second cup? And when you drink the second cup, you just realize the first one's coming. And you say, oh shit, I should not have drank that second cup. That can happen with a booster. So there should be enough time to find out what the effects are, of, are the substance that you have been given before you are given a booster and pushed over the line. Your intention should be sharpened and clarified and rapport and comfort should be established. You should be completely comfortable with your guy before you start working with him. And if there's any question about that, you should walk away. What happens during a guided journey? It's an internal experience. Again, your facilitator should not be your experience. They shouldn't want to be talking to you about things, having chats with you talking to you about your problems to see what their point of view is about it. This is an internal experience. Even in MAPS, NYU, UCLA, all the places where the clinical trials are happening, you're talking about licensed, trained therapists sitting there with people with eye shades and headphones on while they have an internal experience and then talking to them about it afterwards. They're not doing therapy with you while you are under the influence of a psychedelic substance. You're probably going to be in eye shades and headphones much of the time. That depends a lot on your, your intentions and wishes. <coughs> if you decide that's not what you want, you should be able to take breaks. You shouldn't be forced to do this. But if you say, hey, I want you to make sure that I stay in this as much as possible, they should encourage you to do that. Guide should be there the entire time or provide for your needs, and you should know how long they plan to be there. The length of time they plan to be there should be as long as you need me there. Not, I'm going to be here for five hours and I have to leave at six. While you're, still, while you're still deep in the experience. Things you want to say, if you say or you want to remember, should be written down for you. Once again, take note of anything that's said or done that angers or upsets you. And again, a hand to hold. I should say a hand to hold. I have a typo. A hug or comforting touch should be available when appropriate. And you should know when that's going to stop. If you say, I'm not comfortable with this, no one should say, well, that's okay. I'm just going to make you comfortable. Don't worry, it's just me. That should stop immediately when you say, I'm not comfortable with this. Boundary should be very clearly stated up front when you're going to work with a guide. But after the experience, you might be in the pink cloud. That's that state where you feel like anything is possible. This is what happens to a lot of people. They want some kind of change as a result of a psychedelic experience. So you talk about something like integration where you need to make some change after the experience. They'll say, no, I believe me, nothing's going to change after this. I'm going to tell my wife every day exactly how much I love her. And within two weeks, they're going to look at her and say, you know, she's kind of busy doing the dishes. I'm going to tell her tomorrow. The pink cloud fades after a while. You need to be mindful of that. You might have mood swings, heightened emotions, exaggerated reactions. You know, some people call me after an experience, they say, I don't understand it. I just did psychedelics, but I feel really sad. I said, that's good. <laughs> I feel really angry. I'm upset. I'm disappointed. That's because psychedelics will do one of two things. They will show you what you need to work on. If you have a lot of sadness inside of you, you're going to feel sad afterwards. And some people say, well, no, not the kind of sad like you get from psychedelics. I mean, I'm really sad. Well, psychedelics will make you really sad. There's not a sad light or an emotion light that you get from psychedelics. They give you a release valve, and if you have a lot of disappointment built up inside of you, they will allow you to be disappointed until a lot of that's gotten out of you and you feel better, and it's off of you. That's one of the things that's eating you from the inside when you have anxiety, OCD, things like this. Sometimes it's unacknowledged emotions, emotions that you haven't held. Emotions have a beginning, middle, and end. Sometimes we cut them off before the end, we just store them. And it's okay when they're here or here or here. By the time they get up to here, they're too much. There's just a constant hum of anxiety. Psychedelics will open a release valve and let those emotions out of you. They will show you what you need to work on. So when you're working in integration, you need to be mindful of exactly what you're feeling. Not just your experience, your experience, your reaction to it during, your reaction to it afterwards. I'll tell you something about the experience. Once again, you might be disappointed about being cured or getting the, the experience or result that you wanted. Well, I'll tell you one thing. The only way to have a disappointment is to have an expectation. That sounds really simple, but it's really true. The only way to have a disappointment is to have an expectation. <coughs> and it's also true that you don't always get the trip you, you want, but you usually get the trip you need. I believe this experience comes from you and happens for you. That somewhere inside of us, we can hear our higher selves telling us what it is we need to do next. And it's not always what we, what we think. We might think we need to water the tree, but it needs to be pruned. You turn on the GPS, you might think you know how to get from here to there, and GPS says, no, you don't need to go this way. 
So sometimes we might have a goal in mind when we, when we uh, take on a psychedelic journey, but the result isn't always what we're, what we're looking for. Some people get disappointed about that. You need to accept what was given to you as a gift. Sometimes people do what I call stepping over diamonds looking for a pot of gold. So they'll say something like, well, yeah, I get along better with my wife and I'm not agitated in traffic anymore, but I didn't heal my generational trauma. I think that getting along better with your wife and not being agitated in traffic is quite a gift that might take many years to accomplish. You don't always get what you want. You might feel highly connected or you might feel isolated. There might be confusion about what you experience. So once again, psychedelics communicate to us in strange ways and we don't always understand what it is that they are trying to tell us. That can all be worked out in integration and if you think about it. And afterwards there's integration. Oh, I'll back up so I'm going to get a picture. So is integration important? What do you think I was going to say? <laughs> Seriously, it's psychedelia integration. I'm an integration coach. What is psychedelic integration? Psychedelic integration is many things, but I'll tell you one answer. Psychedelic integration is determining the overarching theme, lesson, or message from your journey and integrating that by making it a part of your daily life. That starts with preparation. Then it can include embodiment. That can be things like exercise, laying on the grass, walking barefoot, getting massages, energy work, yoga, examining your experience, acceptance and acknowledgement, once again, that you did get something from the experience, not just that it wasn't what you wanted, because some people walk away from a psychedelic experience very bitter that they didn't get what they wanted and they don't integrate what it is that they got. Some sort of plan. So psychedelic integration involves making some change. Now you might be changed by a psychedelic experience. Integration requires us to be or do different. Being differently, I might decide that I'm going to set more healthy boundaries for myself. I'm going to evaluate certain situations in my life. Doing differently might mean I can develop better habits, patterns. Might mean that I change the way that I interact with certain people. But if something's not different afterwards, then it's up to you to make some kind of change. And it might be a small incremental shift that can make a profound change in your life. But sometimes that's going to feel awkward and uncomfortable and forced. Because for better or worse, your mind does not want you to change. As a matter of fact, your mind thinks it would be a very bad idea for you to change. Because it's gone through a lot of trouble to make you behave in a certain way because you were once hurt and it doesn't want you to get hurt again. That's why it's so hard to change habits even when they know we know that we're, they're not good for us. Even when we can see there's something that we don't want to do, for some reason we just can't stop doing it. Well, you can make small changes in your life to get around those things. But it's a conscious, mindful effort on your part. And as I say, sometimes it feels awkward, forced, unnatural. And one thing that people always say about this is everybody knows that. And I usually ask them, yeah, but who's doing it? So after a plan comes implementation. This is where you make some kind of change in your life. What kind of change depends greatly on what it is you're working on. When I work with people in uh, integration, I work on what they presented with when they came to me and what they learned during their journey. There's usually a connection between those two things. Then we decide what it is that you want to do from now on. What kind of change are you able to make? What kind of change can you make? And how are you going to do that tomorrow and the next day and the next day? So, I know that I said there's no wrong way to do psychedelics, but I think there is a right way. And I think this quote from Jules Evans covers it. You may be having the most extraordinary psychedelic experiences. You may be communicating with DMT entities. Mother Ayahuasca might be visiting you nightly, but if it's not making you a kinder person, then it's just a holiday. After all of this, all of the mystical experiences, ego, death, resistance, difficult experiences, isn't it funny that we're supposed to just be kind of nicer people afterwards? I think that's what we're supposed to, we're supposed to be doing anyway. If you want to stay in touch with me, that's how you can reach me online. This talk will be repeated January 17th at Liberate Hollywood in Hollywood. On the first and third Wednesday of every month, I uh, alternate facilitating integration circles with my good friend John Saul. 
And I facilitate circles in Winnetka on the on Winnetka on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. And with that, I'll thank you and ask if there are any questions. Yes, sir. Is it ever? When would you suggest? I don't know how to ask this question. It, is it ever good to have um, MDMA on the hand in case a person is going on like a, a suicidal trip and maybe they're just it's too hard on them, or maybe it's going how do you say too negative? And have you ever considered is that an option? MDMA potentiates psychedelics. So if someone's having a difficult time, it's not a good thing to give to them. Um, there is such a thing as mixing MDMA and psilocybin, that's called a hippie flip. You can mix exactly. MDMA and LSD, that's called a candy flip, but you should al always be cognizant of the fact that MDMA is going to potentiate that psychedelic. So if X amount of LSD is as strong as you want to go, you need to cut that down a little bit if you're going to mix MDMA with it and be cognizant of when you take it. You know, you're going to take it at the same time, you got to wait until one peaks, but it's definitely not something to give someone if they're having a hard time with an experience. Um, if anything, something like Ativan, something that you give someone, but be very careful about this. It should be someone who understands how these substances work. I wouldn't just give it to someone because it's going too negative. You know, I said there's such a thing as a bad trip, but negative is not necessarily a bad trip, and sometimes I've certainly gone through a lot of negative. So um, I think that's an instance where someone needs to be on hand to understand how bad the situation is and what needs to be done to address it. Can you speak a little to the audience about how the integration circles work? Psychedelic integration circles are safe community spaces where people come to ask questions, do research, they might share experiences, and we get new people all of the time. Ever since Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, was published, there are you know, new people every single circle. People come in asking about microdosing. People come in who've had difficult experiences or bad trips. People come in to share their experiences or share their knowledge. Um, a lot of people come in to do research, but they are usually very, you know, I've been to scores of these things and they're never the same. Um, there's a lot of healing, a lot of information shared, a lot of friendships made, and a lot of community built in the psychedelic integration circles that we hold. Yes, sir. As far as your... Uh someone's experience that you work with what is the extent of that is it is it do you talk to them one session or for one hour or do you talk to them week after week or how long does that usually go on do you, do you keep them accountable for changes they make i'm just trying to understand more about it. accountable for changes is a big part of it having an accountability partner is a big part of this so what is it you want to do and then you're going to report back to me and we're going to talk about you know you, I'm not a taskmaster to tell you you need to be doing that if it's not working for you. What adjustments do we need to make? So usually I recommend someone work in packages of three to five integration sessions because you know, you're know you going to have some goals that you're going to set and you're going to need to track progress on, the goal, on those goals and see how it's working for you. And like I say, if it's too much, you can back up and make another adjustment. Or if you're not ready for that right now, we can address something else. But yeah, it is a process that goes on for a matter of weeks, at least three to five, and I have people who keep coaching with me on an ongoing basis after that. But yeah, I think the three to five sessions are at least what you should have after a significant psychedelic experience with, you know, like an, an untrained integration professional like myself, excuse me, unlicensed integration professional like myself. And I always encourage people to also see a therapist at the same time. You know, when I, uh, years ago, when I started down this path, I worked with psychedelics, the therapist, and a coach at the same time. All were very valuable to me. Yes, sir. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, microdosing and um, what do you think is the right moment to do it or not? Microdosing can be very effective. Um, it depends on what you are working on and what you want to get out of it, what substance you want to work with. So, you know. Microdosing LSD can be very good for focusing on things, for helping you to be productive, for helping you to be creative. It's not especially great for sitting around doing nothing because microdosing LSD, it's not a bad thing. It can bring emotions to the surface. If you're working on something like depression, most people think that psilocybin works better for something like that. I don't know why because you know LSD is also very effective in microdoses for dealing with depression, but 
it depends on the level you're at too. I don't know if someone with major depression, there are a lot of people who've been dealing with depression for years and working with antidepressants, and severely depressed, who want to just start microdosing psilocybin. That worked for some people, it doesn't. Microdosing's been very effective for some people. Microdosing, I think, should be approached by sm starting small and titrating up. Um, I think there are a few problems with microdosing as I see them overall, is that people go and get psilocybin and they break off a piece of mushroom and take it and they don't know how much they took and they're a little bit nervous. If you're nervous, you probably took too much. You should back it up. But say with psilocybin. Psilocybin should always be ground up and measured so that you are consistently microdosing the same amount every time. If not, you're just sort of spinning the roulette wheel and seeing what comes up. Um, if you want to microdose consistently, as in you are medicating yourself or trying to treat something, you need to have consistent regimen. I recommend the James Fadiman protocol. That's microdosing one day off two days, microdosing off two days, whether it's psilocybin or LSD. And with LSD, people will get blotters, and they'll cut it up into pieces and take a piece of it and say, you know, one day it was really strong and one day it was kind of weak. Well, that blotter has a drop of LSD on it that may cover the whole paper, piece of paper. It may cover a corner of the paper. You might be doing a, you know, like an eighth of a hit of LSD one day and getting nothing on another day. Working with LSD, if you're working with blotter, should be done volumetrically. That means you drop it into a certain amount of distilled, not tap water, and or alcohol, let it sit for 24 hours, and then measure that water out. So you have 10 measurements of water with 100 micrograms of, grams of LSD. If you want to take 10 micrograms, now you take one-tenth of that water. You have 10 micrograms. But I suggest starting at something like five and working your way up. Too many people start at 12, 14, 15 micrograms. It should be a tenth of a dose, which is around 10 micrograms, but start lower and work your way up. As soon as you hit the spot where you start getting a little anxious or your feelings a little close to the surface, you need to back up again. Microdosing should be a sub-perceptual dose, so you shouldn't have any psychoactive effects. You shouldn't be having a mini trip. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes? Someone mentioned something called lion's mane. Is that anything? Yeah, lion's mane is a non-psychoactive mushroom. So Paul Stamets, who is a famous non-degree mycologist, who's very well known in the psychedelic community, um, has a protocol where he uses lion's mane mushroom, was generally used to improve cognitive ability. So he uses a microdose of psilocybin. What he does first is he takes lion's mane and niacin, enough niacin to get a serious niacin flush. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, you turn red and you itch all over, it's intense. So once that flush is going, then you take a microdose of psilocybin. The idea is that your capillaries are expanded and that the microdose will, you know, kind of infiltrate your body all over. Yeah, that's the Stamets protocol. And I think he does that three days on and two days off or something. I'm not sure about that part. But there's lion's mane supplement you can buy in there. Yeah. Nothing by itself. Coincidentally, Paul Stamets has, happens to sell lion's mane. <laughs> Paul. The protocol is five days on, two days off. Ah, there you go, five on, two off. Thank you. Yes? So I'm wondering what you think is like the most important work being done in the research of psychedelics. I'm trying to go get my bachelor's. I'm trying to decide which, uh, what my major is going to be, and I kind of want to help in that work somehow. I don't know if you have any advice. I don't have a favorite. You know, there are studies right now being done. I mean, close to my heart is the end-of-life anxiety studies at NYU. I mean, if anyone saw the documentary on that, there was a woman in there who said, I am ruining my life right now. I'm dying of cancer, and I, cannot leave my, I can, can't leave my son and my uh, husband in peace. I'm ruining my life right now because I'm in such a bad mood because I'm dying. Then they showed her laying down on a couch with eye shades and the headphones, and the next scene was her son giving her eulogy, saying from that moment on, she loved every single second of her life right up until the last one. So that has a piece of my heart. You know, helping people to get good with the dying process, to me is fascinating. But so is helping people deal with PTSD like MAPS is. The fact that, the, the fact that there's a condition that it might take years to get someone just to be able to talk about before you start the therapy process, and then possibly with a few sessions of therapy and MDMA, that person can meet their trauma and then start to deal with it, to me, that's incredible. Good for you. Huh? What documentary is that? I don't remember the name of the documentary. I actually saw it on an AWARE Project uh, event, God, like a year ago. Paul? It's uh, Understanding Psilocybin. Okay. It's an hour long. It's really great. Thanks. I'm just going to give Paul the microphone from now on. <laughs> yes? Uh, just from your, from your knowledge, um, with couples, is it 
common for couples to be guided together, or is it a separate experience? It depends on what you're looking for. There is a separate experience, but certainly it's common for couples, not especially to be guided together. Well, you're, we're talking about two different things. There is guiding, such in eye shades as headphones. There is also couples work, couples therapy that's done under the influence of MDMA. So that's, that's I think, a little bit different area, area than doing therapy with people when they're in the influence of psychedelics. MDMA to me is an pathogen at low doses, working with couples. If you've been, you know, usually there's therapy before and therapy afterwards. You know, there's still a therapeutic, therapeutic component to that, and I think it's generally done by therapists. <laughs> Yeah, you can have couples counseling with MDMA. There's a fascinating story of a young Indian woman whose father was from India. He was sort of patriarchal, and he was a nice enough man, but he kind of terrorized the family and made them uncomfortable. And somehow this 19-year-old woman talked her father, mother, sister into doing MDMA with her. <laughs> and during that time, they told her father, you know, we don't like it when you say something to us like this. And this man, who would never take criticism, listened to them, and their relationship changed from that day on. MDA uh, for couples is an absolute gold sometimes. It will bring to the surface the things that you are not working with. If you're not talking about things, it can get a little bit rocky because that will come to surface and it'll show you what you're not dealing with. It'll also allow you to deal with the things that you are dealing with. Yes? Um, when you're talking about microdosing, you mentioned if you have a little too much, you start, you start feeling anxious. Yes. Say a person does a larger, like a half dose or something, and they're feeling anxious. Um, what would you suggest uh, as a way to deal with that anxiety, or for a person to, you know, whatever is their like a thought pattern, or how, learning to accept or deal with that to get through that anxiety? Well, you just provoked it by getting into sort of a gray area. You know, there's an area between microdosing and between psychoactive where it just feels weird you're in some kind of transition. Mm -hmm. But if you've gotten yourself into that space, you're bringing emotions close to the surface. You know, It might not be a bad idea to ride it out, <laughs> depending on how bad it was for you. But uh, yeah, I would say try not to take half a dose and get yourself there, because that's not a good place to be sometimes. Full dose or no, I can't say full dose. That would be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <coughs> what have you seen in terms of healing autoimmune conditions with psychedelics? There is a woman by the name of Caitlin Thompson with the Ware Project in San Diego that has an entire talk on that. Have you seen it? I haven't. I know of her, but I haven't seen it. You can probably find that online. She spoke at Laps and she's spoken at a Ware Project. A Ware Project has Paul, is that one on tape? Yes. Ah, okay. Believe it or not, Paul is the person who records those, so he would know, yeah. <laughs> Paul has recorded both of those. So yeah, if you look for Caitlin Thompson online, you can see her talk on autoimmune conditions and psychedelics and treatment of the, the thing. She knows Probably much more than me about it. Probably on YouTube. Probably on YouTube too also, yeah. Definitely on the AWARE Project website. They've got an archive of all the talks that have been done there. Yes? I'm wondering if you have like any visions of the future of guided therapy. Like what would your dream be if it was all legal and all good? Well, you know, right now there are integration professionals. There are people in the helping profession. I would like to see a space for both licensed therapists and other people to be in supporting roles to help them with that as well. Yes? Isn't that what MAPS is attempting to do? Um, I heard that they're attempting to try and train as many as 300 therapists for their programs. Yeah, MAPS and CIIS, you know, there's going to be a serious shortage of therapists should this therapy be approved. Um, and yeah, personally, I'm kind of worried about the number of people that are trying to run through schools right now to become psychedelic therapists, just between you and me. <laughs> well, it really is, I mean, if you were talking about the book, I mean, it really is at the vanguard of uh, therapy. They don't, I mean, MAPS seems incredibly professional about it that there's such possibility and then learning that they were doing this 50 years ago for treatments and yeah. the high efficacy but there's an avalanche of of need yeah. of people who are desiring it yeah. and 
I'm just kind of wondering, and I think a lot of people are wondering, and, and actually I want to say I'm really glad I came, because um, it's very educational. Who are the professionals, what to look for, <coughs> those kinds of clues. Yeah, I was going to say that I'm talking about underground guides in this talk for the most part, but that evaluation criteria should also hold for professional guides. <laughs> You, obviously, the protocol should be in place. There should be uh, a procedures in place that all of that happens. But with so many people being trained, I think people are going to have to start keeping their eyes open to watch for the qualifications of the professional therapists and guys they're working with when you're talking about training hundreds of people at a time. Yes? I kind of had a question about, um, so one of the questions on choosing a guide was to ask them how many sessions they had guided and where their training was, um, and that sort of thing. And um, I was sort of wondering what, I guess, what the, I guess, almost like apprentice program for that looks like in situations, for example, where like you've been talking mostly about underground therapists in the session and not maps and stuff like that. Like, it seems like the sort of thing where having someone else present just for training purposes for a session could potentially be unethical because you're observing someone else's process. But at the same time, like, just going it completely alone and just, like, practicing with your friends, like, could also, like, potentially lead you into hot water. So, like, what is the sort of, what, what, what does that landscape look like? Well, I think that there are situations where people are mentored by someone else, and if you have someone's consent, it's certainly not objectionable, I think, to say, you know, I'm a male, this is a female, this is a person who's working with me, this is my role, this is this person's role, and disclose, and disclose what their roles are. There are also people who I think have been trained uh, uh, trained for this by sitting for friends. You know, a lot of people become de, de facto sitter for their friends. There are people who have some psychological training, who've done a lot of sitting, who have an affinity for this kind of work, who may work with someone else. I can't tell you what that training should look like. If I was talking about a therapist or professional guide, I could talk more about what sort of formal education or background they should have. But in this case, I think it's going to have to be something that you're comfortable with hearing. You, know, you should be comfortable with the person overall. And then they should explain this to you in a way that sounds good to you, that it makes sense to you. Um, it's really hard to find out someone's training uh, lineage, what is it when you're talking about an underground guide, you know. Um, hopefully it's somebody maybe that was referred to you or they have referrals. I know it's hard for people like that to get references, to make referrals, <laughs> have Yelp pages and things like that. Yeah, I think it has to be something that you're comfortable with when you hear the story. Not so much there's a criteria to compare it to, just something that sounds good to you that makes you feel good when you hear it. Yes? Um, I mean, I just heard literally right before parking for this event on the radio, there's going to be a ballot measure, an attempt to have a ballot measure in California to legalize psilocybin. But in the meantime, um, you know, for a newbie like me, my issue is I'm, I'm just learning about all the, the groups and the type of uh, integration uh, follow-up there is. But, you know, to find a guide in the first place, because this is so underground, is Aware Project, the best method to find a guy? <laughs> Aware Project's not going to tell you how to find a guy. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> so like, yeah, well, I mean, what do you do? You know, all I can tell you is people, people come to integration circles and say, how do I find mushrooms? I said, I don't know. If you hang around the circle long enough and you get to know people and they trust you, you know, things that should come your way may come your way. But, you know, if, if you're still researching and not sure about what to do, I would definitely go to either here or somewhere else, go to gatherings with people like this and talk to people and ask as many questions as possible. Don't, once again, don't rush into something like this. Ask questions, yeah. know what you're working with, know what you're prepared for, know what you can handle. Know what the risks are, know how that compares to your current situation. But yeah, go okay. find people who've been through this. People are glad to share their experience when you go to something like an integration circle. People are only, gl only too glad to sh share their experience with you. Okay, so that's a good way uh, for an introduction. That's a good way to, to be part of the community. Because there are questions like, you know, from taking medications, you know, how that interacts and, you know, what needs to be. Necessary. I will give a shameless plug to my friend Ben Malcolm, spirit pharmacist. Okay. He's definitely a good re resource for that. If I have any questions about that, I go to Ben. Okay. 
You know, when some come, someone comes to me for preparation, if they have, they're taking medication, I don't know the answer rather than going to Google, I'll do a consult with Ben, because he'll tell you right up front exactly what it is and how it works or what questions to ask. But yeah, in general, you know, Google can be your friend, but also when it comes to general questions about psychedelics, yeah, uh, people come to, to uh, circles and say, what's this LSD thing? I mean, there are entry level questions all the way up to complex questions in integration circles. That's what they're for. All are welcome. Yes? Uh, do you have any opinions or thoughts about the different training programs for psychotherapists to do this work? Um, I don't, actually. I know that there's a person here who's thinking about that kind of training. You might ask him. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm saying right here. <laughs> right now, there's only three, two. Yeah. yeah, so there's CIIS. Yeah. Maps. Maps. Yeah, an eight path, yeah. Um, I was going to say that our uh, we're doing a talk next month with um, the guy from N8 Path is coming. Ah, so, so Tara says that uh, someone from N8 Path will be doing a talk here next month. Be a good one to attend. I'll be here. Can I get a ticket now? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you think it might be a good idea also for someone thinking about doing that to maybe go spend, if, they're, if they have the ability to go? Um, you mean with the potential guide? Yeah. To meet them in person? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, for, and in order for you to be comfortable, you know, I think it's one thing to talk to somebody on the phone. It's one thing to talk to somebody online. It's another thing to get up close to them and let your body feel the energy of that person, see if you're comfortable with them. Yes? Would you, um, you or any other guide, would, would you think that, um, would it be advisable You know, so depending on what type of psychological disorder someone has, I would say probably the best thing to do would be for them to get a psychological evaluation with a therapist who understands working with psychedelics. And that's something that I refer people to sometimes. When they come to me for preparation and ask me if they think, if I think that they should work with psychedelics, if there's something like an identity disorder, history, history of schizophrenia, borderline personality, other uh, personality disorders, sometimes I will refer them to a therapist to get a full evaluation for that person to say whether or not you know, if someone's a little untethered from reality at times, it's very dangerous for them to use psychedelics because they can become untethered from reality and be stuck there. So yeah, I would think someone that has any question like that should probably get an evaluation from a therapist who understands what it's like to work with psychedelics. Yes? I'm wondering if you could give your opinion on nausea. Um, like if during microdosing, is nausea an indicator that maybe taken too much? Are we talking about, so nausea when microdosing, you're talking about psilocybin? Yeah. Um, is someone taking this just like ground up mushroom in the mouth? It's not ground up, it's measured with a scale. So is it measured a piece of a mushroom? Yeah. So I'm going to immediately say that it should be ground up because there's no guarantee, you know, there <coughs> might be, let's say that there is um, X amount of psilocybin in a mushroom. Mm -hmm. 80% of that might be in cap, in the cap, and 20% in the stem. So there are times when you're getting a lot of psilocybin, and times when you're gonna get a lot less of psilocybin. That's why I say it should be ground up and homogenized. And I would say put into a capsule. Then when you take it, you don't have the, you know, the problem with mushrooms is that you're turning psilocybin into psilocybin in your stomach. It's kind of an intense process. So when you take the raw mushroom in, or the dried mushroom in, sometimes it's stuff on your stomach. Get some double lot capsules measured out, put it in the capsules after it's ground, and then put those away, then you just grab a capsule. Orange juice is also good. Orange juice is also good. Orange juice can also intensify psilocybin, so you have to be careful with the citric acid of any kind. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Um, you mentioned settings. Uh, as a, uh, just would it be more common to be someone that you're familiar with, your house, your... You know, is there a kind of a normal procedure you always recommend people to start with? What I recommend is that you not be in a place where you are uncomfortable, where there is some bad energy or where something happened that you didn't like. <laughs> when I say bad energy, that's what I'm talking about. I also think that it should be clean and comfortable for you in that sense. And I think it should be a place where you are comfortable and not worried about being disturbed. 
Is there a hand up over here? Oh, yes. So, sorry, I apologize. I missed the very beginning. So, if you covered this, um, but if somebody, if, if somebody came in um, without a specified intention and just sort of out of curiosity, like, how, do, you, do you sort of indulge or entertain that or satisfy that? Well, I think that's probably, uh, you know, I'm an integration coach, so I'll work with people in preparation. That's one of the things I work on them with. But if someone is going to a guide, they don't have an intention, I would ask them why they're going to a guide. Uh, it, I would hope that a guide would ask them why they're there. If you don't have an intention, it doesn't have to be polished, but there should be a reason why you're doing this. And I would think that if a guide is taking someone who doesn't know why they're doing this, they're probably taking people with a little bit of lax standards, you know. There should be a reason for this. It might be just I want to have the experience, but um, if you don't have a reason for taking it, then I'm going to want to ask you some more questions. There must be a reason. Maybe you're just not coming up with it. Maybe you don't want to tell me. Maybe it's not clear to you yet. Yes. Individual sensitivity is all over the map. You know, one and a half grams to one person might put them on their back. Three and a half grams to someone might be a little pleasant journey. And psychedelics aren't linear. So if you were took, you know, uh, I'm talking when I say grams, I'm talking about psilocybin, obviously not LSD. Let's say you took uh, two grams of psilocybin. You say this is the effects of two grams of psilocybin. If I take another gram, I should have 50% more. That's not how it works. At some point, it becomes exponential. So it's hard to dose based on what you've already taken. You have to be careful in dosing up, but I always recommend that someone start lower and work their way up. You can always come back again. There's always an opportunity to do a booster as well. So you can take a little bit of psilocybin and you can wait an hour and decide I'm not as deep as I want to be and take a little bit more and see where you are. And you know, people will take what they want to take. But I say if you want to be safe, if you think maybe you're sensitive, start on the low end and work your way up. Come back again some other time. But you know, individual sensitivity is all over the map. And there wouldn't be necessarily indicators other than maybe starting low as a safe trial. Yeah, there's no way to know. It has not, you know, uh, height, weight, body mass index, those things come into play a little bit, but really not that much when it comes to psychedelics. Not the same, not the same way that it does with like standard pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah, are you talking about like at this stage you'll have ego death and at this stage it's, yeah, you know, I, I don't buy into that too much. You know, there's there are some places where they literally say, you, if you take this much LSD, you're going to have a mystical experience and this much you'll have ego death. And that assumes that everyone is the same. And even if everyone is the same, that still wouldn't be the same for everyone. You know, psychedelic experience is different for every person every time. So if there was a dose that you did that caused ego death, the next time it might might not do the same thing. I don't know how many times I've done psychedelics expecting the same time as last time and been shown time and time again that's not what's going to happen. Probably because I had an expectation. Yeah, but the charts that show what happened at certain doses, I just don't believe. Yes? That question or your answer, whatever the interchange rates, one more for me. And, um, and this one, it's a tough one to answer, so but we can just play with it. Uh, what would possibly be the effects of psychedelics on the human aura, on their chakra system. And unless you can take a photograph, I know it's not easy. I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just like to yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yes? First of all, I wonder, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
original subjects in the NAPS clinical trial and really protected with that research. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for um, helping to educate everyone and stay safer and not to get into trouble. That jeopardizes the legalization process every time that happens. So I'm really grateful. Um, has anybody been talking about any kind of registry for therapists that um, it has to be kind of underground, of course, but to say, yes, I agree to this standard and just stand in solidarity with the, you know, certain standards so that there is a, a public account, not necessarily like I treat people, but just I, would, I don't treat anybody, but I would say, yes, these standards, I agree to them, I support them so that there's some continuity in the community. You know, in the um, AWARE Projects documentation, they do also have like a, a what is in there, Paul? There's like a code of ethics, right? There's a code of ethics. Standards of conduct. And LAMPS is also talking about codes of ethics. Yep. Okay. That well. That's so something that's on the... No, there's nothing so far like trying to unify that into a single code of ethics that people sign on to. I think there are different, there are a few different efforts going on to sort of codify this stuff. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Just wonder if it happened yet. Yeah, no, not yet that I know of. <laughs> Maybe we can start it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> say, I really love what you say, and I'm going to just write my name. I, mean, I love this. I support this. You know, I'm into it. I mean, to volunteer to create a page somewhere that that can be located. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Yes. How often uh, is it beneficial to take sick monthly, weekly? You know, beneficial. How often? How how often is it beneficial to take psychedelics? I think is a very personal choice. Um, I think that once you are, I think you should be done processing the last experience before you jump into another experience. So a lot of people don't do integration. One of the things that happens with integration is it's very much misunderstood. People think that journaling or yoga are integration. Those are integration therapies. They might help you with integration, but if you are already doing journaling before your experience and you're doing journaling after and it's not leading to some change, then you're just doing the same thing. It's not really integration. So a lot of people don't understand that integration is sort of embodying your experience and making some change. Once that's been baked into your life and you've made some change or you feel differently or you do differently, then I think you consider another journey. It's up to any, you know, people can do psychedelics every month if they want to. That's not up to me to say, but if you're asking my opinion, I think that you should be able to process the last experience efficiently. Because when you don't integrate and you keep doing psychedelics, you will see people who become a little bit unstable and maybe a little bit obsessive about being called to the medicine and constantly working with psychedelics. You know, I always say if you don't integrate, that is by being or doing differently, if you don't integrate, you are having a one-time experience every time you take psychedelics. Because you might feel change, but psychedelics don't necessarily change us. They show us what needs to be changed, and it's up to us to do the work after that. There are times when psychedelics will change people. Some people have a psychedelic journey, and suddenly they don't feel anxious anymore. Suddenly they make their bed every day. Suddenly they get along with their loved ones. But more often than not, people have the experience, believe that everything's changed, and then after a few weeks they say, yeah, I just kind of went back to my old habits after a while, I'm not sure why. It's because you didn't do anything to make some kind of change. That can be something very simple like making your bed every day, which you have to make your bed every day until it becomes a habit part of what you do. But if you don't do anything after the experience and go back to psychedelics, you can have as many experiences as you want to. It's okay to have a one-time experience over and over again, but that's what you're doing if you don't integrate and make some change afterwards. So if you're asking me, it's when you have integrated the last experience and made some change, then I think you can consider doing it again. My personal opinion. Yes? Uh, you guys are subject of uh, intervening and interrupting. Uh, how do you know that is a matter of someone's understanding of the person, their history, what they might be going through, uh, human psychology. There's a combination of all those things. The guide's uh, knowledge, experience, intuition, um, and evaluation of the situation at the time. All of those things go into deciding whether or not you ask someone what's going on or tell them that they're okay or interrupt them in the middle of a process. So there's no cut and dried uh, instructions for it. 
I can't tell you that if this happens, you should intervene. That's why someone should have some training and some experience and understand psychology and know that person's history and know them before they engage with them because that's going to help them figure out when and if to intervene. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Thank you for that question because it made me remember a part of your presentation which I was hoping you'd explain. Maybe this is too subtle to maybe, I don't know, but when you're doing the music and you play it and you stop and you said, wait, can everybody remember where you park? That, can you just explain that move you were doing? <laughs> yeah. I really like that, like Trick Survive. And I think you were saying something about, um, I think you were saying something about interruption and, and life. No, I, I apparently didn't do it right because what I did was I started off telling you that the song was about someone who was very kind to you when you were young. This might have been the microphone. When I stopped it, I just tried to redirect, re redirect your attention so it was a little bit of wiped out, and then went back and said the song was about someone who passed away. Right, the point in between, you said something. It's called the pattern interruption. Exactly. Thank you, my friend. Yes. There's a pattern interruption to make you stop thinking about the person who used to be kind to you and start thinking about something else before I started telling you about someone who passed away. Okay, that's beautiful, but why? Um, because I wanted to demonstrate the point that music, you know, there are a lot of people who think that it's manipulative to use a certain kind of music to evoke emotions, but there's obviously a school of thought that says that, you know, sometimes people will cry, be in extreme grief during an uplifting, happy song. Sometimes people will be crying tears of joy during something like, you know, um, Greg Haynes' 183 times, uh, songs that are considered to be very sad, you know, and very moving. So sometimes people are going through the psychological process regardless of the music. Music can be evocative and provocative, and it can push you a little bit, but it doesn't make you have emotions that you're not already experiencing. And sometimes you apply the context to that music and say, oh, this, this sounds like it's about someone who died. This sounds like it's about a person who is kind to me. Sometimes the music fits into your experience and not the other way around. Makes that distinct memories of, of tripping and listening to music. I mean, so into music and then someone turning it off, and then all of a sudden it's the best thing that they turn it off to. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any well? Yes? Yeah, some people microdose for two or three months at a time. They maybe take a month off. Some people might, you know, there's, uh, what's, the name of the, what's the name of the woman who wrote the book, Very Good Day? I'm sorry, I forget her name. Yeah. Yes, she microdosed for a month, correct? Yeah. One month. 30 days. 30 days this woman microdosed. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Micro, Albert Hoffman was microdosing until he was over 100 years old. But you know, it's, uh, that varies from person to person too. You know, if you think there's some benefit, maybe you can get off it now and see where you are. You know, if it lifts you up, if it helps you through something, maybe it's time to back off and see how you do without it. And then maybe if you think it's helpful, you get back on. Some people microdose for 30 days. Some people microdose intermittently and they don't really have a regular regimen. But if you really want to see some benefit, if you're doing it for a reason, I recommend doing it in you know, an organized fashion according to a protocol measure it out and then figure out how long you're doing it. So sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's two or three months, some people microdose for six months. Depends on what kind of support you need and how it's helping you. All right. Yes? A uh, question on cold hard numbers. How much would it cost to you know, have a pre-integration session, a guided therapy session, post-integration, like the whole thing, like what kind of numbers are we talking about? Like hundreds I don't know what, you know, I'm, you know, different guides charge different amounts. I don't know what that is. Some people package that in with like a pre and post thing. So uh, that's not a number that I can tell you about. Yes. What about your services specifically, the integration coaching? Integration coaching, my rate's 125 per hour. Thanks. That's for preparation and that's for all of my coaching services, standard rate. All right. I think we might be ready to go home. <laughs>